We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Michael Oliver from Momentum Structural Analysis. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. How are you? Good to be back, Tom. So, Michael, I'd like to start, obviously, you know, we're, let's say, three weeks out from the election, the U.S. election here. Are the markets pricing in the election and what momentum indicators are confirming or disconfirming this? Well, that's that's a good thing, good point you made, because everybody, when they talk about markets, they talk about, well, earnings, uh, oh, a data point, oh, the Fed's going to soften on rates, oh, good, you know, all these things that they normally talk about going back decades. It was always the, the subjects that shaped the stock market, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you know, nobody's talking about the what we say is going to be an uncopacetic outcome. No matter who wins this election, it will not be copacetic, mm-hmm. meaning it's not going to be normal. You know, it's, it's always no matter how much the anger is on both sides, it always sort of settles down after the election. And, you know, hey, he won, so we'll fight him in Congress type thing, you know. And so, but th- this time it's not going to be that way. And yet I don't think that's priced into the market at all. I don't hear it as a conversation like, you know, on uh, CNBC or Fox Business. I don't hear that particular aspect or factor being priced into, you know, should stock prices be this high, you know, if we're going to enter instability, you know, it's not priced in. Mm-hmm. So it's just something to consider if you're in the stock market and believe in forever upward, you know, uh, ponder on that. Uh, this is this is different this time. Well, I think there's two kind of pieces that we need to separate when we're having that that discussion. One of them is the election and obviously all of what we just mentioned. And I think the other part of it is this idea that usually this this fall in the stock market happens after the first couple of rate cuts, right? Yeah, that's something most people don't haven't done their history lesson around. You don't have to be a technician. You just have to go back and look mm-hmm. and uh, look at the S&P, for example, after the dot-com top, you know, 2000 at top, year 2000, up and down. It, it didn't feel like a top. It felt, hey, you know, it keeps making a marginal new high here and there. And basically, it held its ground. And so anybody who was bearish, in fact, the term, uh, it's going to be a soft, soft landing, mm-hmm. that, that was invented then, okay? Uh it was in the Wall Street Journal editorial, I think. Um, in January of 2001, literally several handful of months off the high, which had been in August of 2000. So January, first day of January 2001, the Fed cut rates half a point. Mm-hmm. Okay. And at the end of the month, they cut rates again. Go back and look at a price chart, January 2001, and tell me it was a good time to be buying stocks. Now, prior to that, they've been raising rates up through mid-2000, okay? And they ceased rate cuts then. And then they started cutting rates. And then tell me that was good, (laughs) okay? Then go to 2007. In fact, I've got a chart I sent you. Mm -hmm. uh, It shows the S&P 500 weekly action in the year 2007. And 2007 was the year we topped. But you'll see that you ran up in about mid-year, you crested. And you pull back at a sharp drop. And then you came back up and you were just below the high in September of 2007. In mid-September, the Fed cut rates a half a basis point. For the next three and a half to four weekly bars, after that rate cut that circled on that top chart, you went up and took out the highs. Okay, great. Fed cut rates, it's good, right? Okay, Mm -hmm. that was the top, period. You went to hell after that. Okay, and they cut rates all the way down. So the last two major bull market peaks Basically, if you'd shorted when the Fed cut rates the first time, after a prior couple of years of raising rates, you, you nailed the top. Mm-hmm. So now we have the same type of thing. It's now three and a half to four weeks later, which is September 18th, I think, uh, they cut rates. And all of us, you've had this like three, four weekly bars up to a new high. Now, notice, though, that the, well, the S&P made a new high marginally. It's really not all that much above. It's July high, by the way. Uh, And Dow made a new high. And that gets, you know, heralded on the nightly news every night, you know, on the the financial channels. 
NASDAQ 100 hasn't made a new high. Now, maybe it will, but so far it hasn't. And it's been the leader index for the last 15 years on the upside. It's gone up 17 fold, while the S&P went up eight fold you know, from its 2009 low. So the leader index isn't leading right now. The S&P and the Dow are. Uh, and, and, and it's a rate cut, and it could almost lay the chart on top of the 2007 chart. So it'll be quite curious if the S&P starts to roll over now, because we've got some momentum-based trigger numbers, not price chart, that say you can't sneeze a percent or so, because if you do, I'm going to start to break some first tier levels of momentum trend breakage. In other words, that if it were a price chart and you saw my momentum chart, you'd say, ooh, something broke. OK, mm -hmm. uh, you don't see it on a price chart. But there's some levels not far below on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 that will turn this into a monster bear. And I think if you start the dominoes toppling and today is, is you're doing this interview, uh, the market's down a bit. Now, I don't know if it's going to continue, but it can't continue much more because if it does, it'll start knocking these dominoes over. Mm -hmm. In which and case, you will have a replica of the 2007 chart. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say we're recording this on the on the morning of October 15th, so just yeah. just for some context of of what's going on here. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's I think that's where we are. I think we're going to break the S&P and the Nasdaq down, and there's some other major indices in the world now. We're the biggest bubble in the world among the developed economies. Mm -hmm. For instance, you look at Europe and Europe versus its 2009 low is, you know, yeah, it's it's nicely above it, but it isn't seven fold above it or 17 fold above it like NASDAQ. So it's not a, the same kind of situation. It's been moving with us, but in much less dimension. Mm -hmm. And you go over to look at the Nikkei. You know, it's had a sharp move. Of course, we know currency degradation helps do that. And the Sensex in India also has been quite ballistic, but they're also in sync with us in the, in the sense that when we go down a couple of months, they go down a couple of months. When they go up, we surge, they surge. They have the same momentum trend structures pending right below where they are now, not far below, that if they drop that little bit, they're going to blow, break the backbone of their momentum trend, coincident with us. So we're not isolated in that regard. Now, China is different. And everybody's focused on China. They got goosed recently because of what? The central bank came in and said, we're going to, you know, we're going to buy you. OK, mm -hmm. and so you get a nice sharp rally. But China right now isn't even double where they were at the 2009 low. So, again, even if they do roll over, despite the government intervention, uh, they're not a bubble. We're a bubble. Uh, so we have far more risk, I think, on the downside than most other indices. Mm -hmm. And Michael, just for some context, what has happened to the to the yen over that same time? Like, have they printed not necessarily as much, but you know, thinking about that mm -hmm. um, that degradation in purchasing value or purchasing power over time, mm -hmm. should they be double? Uh, yeah, no, I that that's what's helped get the Nikkei where it is. Is you know when you look at the Nikkei, it's measured in yen. Mm -hmm. You know that we converted back to dollars and with our ETFs and so forth. But the Nikkei is an expression of that degradation, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we've got a crisis not just coming for the dollar relative to the other pieces of paper, which is sort of a silly measurement in contrast because they're all effectively worthless unbacked currencies. Okay. We've ended gold backed currencies in the developed world, especially. Uh, Alistair McLeod, a friend of ours, he made a speech in, in London uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's quite good. You ought to look it up on online. I think you can find we, it on YouTube. We can, About we can put minutes. that link in the show notes. Oh, that, that'd be good. It's, uh, he's, he's quite eloquent and very good in 20 minutes, but he he gives a very good academic yet emotional because you know if you got a good idea then it creates an emotion you know at least it's a, your emotions linked to rationality okay uh and he in 20 minutes explains the nature of the crisis that's about to hit and as he explains it's not just the dollar it's all the fiat currencies mm -hmm. and so while we look at the dollar index for example which is trading right now about 103 uh it uh in our assessment, it's going to break down versus the other currencies. That's all it measures. It doesn't measure its intrinsic value. Uh, 
And I think you you drop, for instance, next year down to um, b- below 99 level. Now, we've been down close to 100 already this year. So starting in three months, you move into the next year. And our annual momentum of the dollar, in fact, a 10-year average momentum oscillator, is going to blow a trend line going back decades, mm-hmm. meaning we're likely headed down big in the dollar relative to the other pieces of paper. But that's not really the issue. The issue is the degradation of the money units is now – getting to the point where it, what it impacts prices that people pay, you know, and, uh, and they think, you know, the commodities are going, no, the commodities aren't really going up, nor is gold going up. They're going up only because the dollar is going down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really the degradation of the money unit you're seeing on those upward charts of, of the gold market, for example. Um, and that's a point that Alistair made in his speech. Uh, and it, I, I strongly suggest you spend 20 minutes to listen to it. But anyway, I think we've got a crisis coming this, this time around rather than the busting of the dot-com bubble or the mortgage market in the U.S. Again, private market. OK, uh, this time it's government debt. It's government paper. And we look at our you know GDP to debt ratio, you know, ratio here is, is off the page. And no matter who becomes, uh, you feel sorry for who's the next president because a lot of stuff's going to happen, regardless of who wins that election. Stuff that's built up over the decades that needs to unleash and perhaps collapse. And unfortunately, that next person is going to inherit it. And uh, its I think it's going to be hell in the markets mm-hmm. if you're on the wrong side, that is. But on the right side, it'd be great. <laughs> so, Michael, I want to go back to this this idea of these of the general markets here how does liquidity affect that and do you think that the fed could have been partially reacting to maybe the the idea that they see the need for more liquidity in those markets considering yeah. the 500 basis point cut instead of let's say 250 that they made yeah no uh, powell's made this clear if you if you just listen to him and apparently a lot of people on financial networks don't uh, they think, oh, they'll slow up now, go to a quarter. They're concerned. And he said outright, almost explicitly as you can, we've shifted from one mandate to the other mandate, the other mandate being the economy and employment. He sees something there that spooks him. Now, he can't come out and pound the table about that because then he, he spooks the market even further. But that's what he sees. That's why they've shifted from their, quote, inflation fighting to defending the economy, because he sees stuff happening underneath the surface. And if you examine just the job reports of, let's say, the last four or five months and look inside and see where the job creation has been, it's laughable. I mean, there's nothing wrong with people who work in hospice and and home care and, and are bartenders and waiters. That's fine. It's a good job. But, you know, that that's where most of the growth has been also in government. Of course, we all know that's essential for the economy. Uh, but when you go to things like manufacturing, you know, it's been down. Uh, and, and transportation slat, you know, things things that are core to the economy that you would normally think of as being important. That's not where the job growth is. So even the, quote, positive job growth we've had is, is baloney. And Powell knows that. And if he's smart, he knows that if the stock market breaks, that's when all those data points shift. You know, if you go back and look at history where the tops occurred in the S&P and then the down occurred, the real bad data points came after that fact. They didn't lead the market down. They followed it down. Mm -hmm. So the Fed is now very concerned about uh, solvency and things like that. And they they also see a problem with their own debt. Uh, But anyway, so there's a crisis out there and he sees it. And that's why he started to cut rates, despite his, you know, attempt to be fatherly and calm. (laughs) So, Michael, that's something that I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit more is this, let's say, the the structure of the bond and, and treasury market right now. You know, there's so much over the last four years, so much of this debt that's been put on the short end of the curve. Yeah. So how does that affect Powell's decision here, considering a lot of that debt needs to be rolled over? Is is Do you think the Fed is is worried? And or just very aware of rolling that debt over and the the actual cost of 
just interest alone on that debt over the next. Well, I think years. they know there's a crisis coming. Uh, they'd have to be daft if they didn't. I think they know there's a debt crisis coming, mm-hmm. and it doesn't seem to halt. In other words, the GDP to debt, you know, it doesn't. It gets worse and worse, no matter who's the president. You know, for decade after decade here, and. <sighs> That can't continue. There's a point at which you have incremental change or, de- or destruction of, of a certain asset. And then there's a point at which you have a chaos theory type degradation of a certain asset. In this case, we're not talking about mortgages or, or uh, you know the dot-com top. We're talking about government debt. And Japan has a crisis. We all know that. They print money like crazy to solve it. Even the you know, Chinese have come in to try to save their real estate state market. But we've got a much bigger problem. And they know that. And they're not in total control of that because they're not in control, control of spending, government spending. You know, mm-hmm. So they can influence it, try to support it and all that. But they know there's – I think he, he knows that – there's a point here where breakage could occur and be dramatic, not incremental anymore. And he doesn't know when that's going to occur. I can pretty much tell him you break that stock market and get it rolling and you break its quarterly momentum and annual momentum to the downside, which doesn't take much percent wise. You know, we've had many 10 and 15 percent corrections. You cannot have that again. If you do it, it's not going to be 10 percent. OK, it's going to be 50, 80 uh, percent. That kind of drama is coming and it's in their lap. It's no longer a corporate problem, a brokerage firm failing, you know, et cetera. Uh, and it's not just the U.S., but, you know, we are the biggest bubble. There's no question, our stock market in particular. And if it goes, public sentiment go out the window because people are already hurting because things are tight. If you take their retirement account and take 20% off of it in two, three months or 30%, how, how panicked will they be on top of what now is going to be rising commodity prices again by our assessment? We think that the pullback in commodities ended effectively a year ago and they've gone sideways. Now they're about to reassert themselves, despite the Fed claiming that's what's inflation. That's just one aspect of, quote, inflation. Uh, and I think well, that's what gold knows. And I think your, your prime beneficiary is going to be the monetary metals, especially silver. Right? But uh, the T-bond market itself, the long end, they don't really control that well, as you know. Uh, and that market doesn't behave in accordance with rate cuts. So, you know, recently they cut rates. So what the T-bonds do? They <laughs> rose in yield, you know, the last four weeks or so, a sharp drop in price. And we view that drop as counter trend. I think what's really going on in T-bonds is they're about to become that alternative asset category once again. That, you know, the orthodox theory of 60%, 40% bonds, 60% stocks. That was a disaster in the year 2022 because all those categories collapsed. But this time around, bonds do look positioned technically to produce a sharp rally that might last a couple quarters. Now, by our metrics, they broke out to the upside in July. I'm talking T-bonds, long-ended data, uh, T-bond futures. They've recently pulled back about to their breakout point, and I think they're going to turn up again from here. And I think that's partly an expression of some large and skeptical asset managers in the stock arena who's starting to move money, you know, two, three percent here, four or five percent there, out of the stock market, which they see as vulnerable or high, more risk than reward remaining, uh, and move it into gold miners, for one thing. Uh, you know, like uh, Stanley Druckenmiller back in February announced he was selling some big name tech stocks and buying Newmont world's largest gold miner, you know, mm-hmm. Newmont Corp. And at that time, if you go back and look at the charts in mid-February, it was trading around 31, 32. But right now it's trading 55. So he's done fairly well in six months. And yet there's no headlines about mm-hmm. how the gold miners are doing well on a percentage basis. Uh, all they're looking at is the S&P and stuff like that, NVIDIA. Uh, there's also movement, I think, into the T-bond market. And it's becoming, if you look well, look at the stock market for the last four weeks since the rate cut. Straight up. What's the bond market done? Straight down, meaning higher yields. Mm -hmm. So they've been moving opposite. And I think they'll continue to move opposite as assets flow out of the high risk arena into the what we view as temporary safety of the T-bond market. Now, ultimately, the T-bond market is a potential disaster we've been talking about here. Uh, but right now, for the moment, for the next, let's say, quarter or so, especially if the stock market begins to roll over in a way that 
becomes noticeable, especially to portfolio managers. Uh, you're going to get more money moving into T bonds, and you could get a goose out of that, a nice, a good surge. But when you look at the long term trend of T bonds, you can look at a yield chart one way or look at the price chart. And we run momentum studies of the price action, they're broken. Even if you get a good rally now that lasts another quarter or two, uh, this counter to the stock market, let's say, uh, it's not going to change the major trend of the bonds, which is to the downside in price higher in yields. And that is going to reflect what we were talking about earlier, a crisis in government debt, mm-hmm. hence panic by the central banks, hence refueling the tank of gold. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Well, also very likely refueling the inflation tank as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, when they inflate, see, they, they define inflation as their CPI and all that stuff. And a lot of the components there are commodity related, you know, gasoline prices and so forth. And if you go back through history, you'll see times where monetary inflation doesn't help. Well, for example, from 2000 to 2002 or 2007 to nine, where they inflated like crazy and cut rates like crazy, it didn't help. Investors, portfolio managers decided to move that excess liquidity somewhere where they perceived it to be lower risk, better reward. At those points in time, it happened to be T-bonds and gold, 2000, 2007. If you look at T-bonds and gold, they they started a launch while the stock market rolled over. Uh, So, And the Bloomberg, for example, commodity index doesn't really correlate well historically to gold. So, you know, you think... Gold follows, quote, commodity inflation. No, that's not the case. Commodity inflation is when certain assets, the liquidity created by central banks, move into commodity-related sectors or commodity assets themselves and cause those prices to rise as opposed to, let's say, stock prices. You know, stock prices have boomed for 15 years. Commodities haven't. But in 2020, late 2020, when gold had already doubled between its low in 2015 to mid-2020, Bloomberg Commodity Index had been going down the whole time. And then when gold went into its range-bound situation, remember after the summer high in 2020, it didn't go up anymore. It was trapped. Bloomberg exploded. Well, gold had already done its thing. Now gold has reasserted itself by our metrics in March. It said, I'm, I'm launching for the next major move. Uh, gold then was around 2000 Silver was just above $25. At that point, after the in early 2022, when the actually the war began, Ukraine, Russia, in February 2022, late February, in March, April, May of 2022, the commodity markets peaked. They'd already had their run up before that war event, so they like to blame it on the war event. That wasn't it. It was assets moving into the commodity category. But since then, they had a major correction. Bloomberg corrected about 50 percent of the way back to its bear market low. It occurred in 2020. That low was 58. It went from 58 to 140 and then pulled back to around either side of 100 for the last year. You know, nothing, just sideways. Its technicals now look like it's going to reassert itself. And if that's the case, it won't take much upside to demonstrate that, to prove that, at least by our metrics. It's going to be joining gold. Now, one of the last times that occurred in a significant way, was the late 70s during the period of, quote, stagflation. Mm-hmm. That's when gold went from, you know, $100 in summer low of 76, $103, up to 850 by January of 1980, an eightfold move. In that latter part of that move, the Bloomberg and the CRB index exploded with gold. They didn't outpace it, but they followed it. So I think we're about in that same situation right now where this time around, commodities are actually going to follow gold, though. And it'll be one of the arenas, especially if you're a stock investor. Uh, look at the agriculture related stocks, look at energy related, base metal related. They don't correlate well to the stock market, which is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they all look like they're going to be full participants in a commodity upturn here. So it may be a place to, if you want to stay in the stock market, look at those arenas. Michael, you know, as you're explaining this, I, I want to go back to this one example and this this idea of the measuring stick that everything else is measured by, right? The the mm-hmm. dollar. If, as you said in your earlier example, if you know we lose twenty to thirty percent of everybody's retirement accounts, um, 
over, let's say, a two or three month period, does that not create more demand for the dollar because people are selling whatever they have out of, let's say, the stock market and yeah. creating mm-hmm. demand for dollars, thereby pushing the relative, mm-hmm. you know, measuring stick value of everything yeah. else, gold that, that, as that, well. That's down. logical. That makes some sense. I agree. But if you go back historically and forget the fundamental argument, just look at the historical major moves up and down in the dollar index. Now, again, we're not measuring. That's not really the value of the dollar. That's the dollar versus other fiat currencies. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the dollar index trends, major swings, don't always, sometimes they're quite coincident with the stock market. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go back and look at the last major low in the dollar index, it was, it was in 2008. The stock market made its last major low in March of 2009. And look what's happened from then to now in both the dollar index, which peaked back in 2022 at uh, 115. Now it's trading 103. But the broad move of that you know, decade plus, they were in sync with each other. Mm-hmm. The stock market went up, the dollar went up. Now suddenly the dollar is looking technically very vulnerable, as is the stock market by our metrics. So I'm of the view that no, uh, the dollar breaks down despite the breakdown in the stock market being coincident. I don't think it's going to assist the dollar at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, And ultimately, I think all the fiat currencies, the major ones, are in trouble Mm -hmm. to the point where at some point, and I don't think it's the kind of thing that takes 10 years to make the point. If you know what I mean? There are a lot of trends that become crises or incremental. This one could go very quickly, I think, whereas a lot of snapping sounds occur rapidly. Like, I think a lot of this could occur in terms of its drama between now and the end of next year mm-hmm. uh, pretty rapidly because the, the technical dynamics look that way to me. Uh, like, when you start breaking some of these things that we're measuring, and again, they're not evident on price charts. Uh, you'll go fast. You know, it's it's interesting to to try to understand that there are, you know, so many different pieces to how this market functions and the the movements that end up unfolding and creating chaos over, let's say, short term. Um, mm-hmm timeframes versus longer term timeframes. And I think that's always really important to keep perspective on these longer term timeframes. And I think very evident in that was what we saw from silver last week. You know, it kind of broke down from this this Mm -hmm. rise that it had. So do the momentum charts tell a different story than the price breakdown last week for silver? And and what does this what does this divergence between price and momentum mean in your analysis? Well, I back in 87, I caught the crash. I was a futures broker then. Okay. I've been a futures broker since 75 up to 92. In 92, I founded MSA. Okay. And I shifted to research for institutions primarily at that point. But in the case of, if you looked at the S&P back in 87 and looked at its price chart, it looks very much like today. Where you go up and you have a like a distribution zone where it sort of plateaus for a while, where the sellers and doubters enter the market and cause it to stop. And then you get this surge of, oh, we're on the game's on again. You know, it looked exactly like we have now. In fact, the momentum structure then was an overlay of the NASDAQ chart that, that I sent you, the, the NASDAQ quarterly, where there's this floor that's been in existence for about two years on momentum, where you see the momentum lows keep coming back to the same general level. Mm -hmm. So if it were a price chart and you drew a line across these lows, you'd say, ooh, we better not break through those lows, oscillator lows. The price chart, meanwhile, doesn't show that kind of vulnerability. It didn't in 87 either. And I I think that that's, we're facing, usually momentum will lead price in terms of defining a trend change. In other words, you'll see momentum break something very clear And then price will suddenly join it two, three months later, or two, three weeks later. And you say, oh, God, why did that happen? Well, the momentum already told you a month ago, two months ago, you're dead. OK. And, it, and the market finally caught on. So like, for instance, in 87, the market uh, in September is making a new high above a prior range of action. 
distribution zone, August, September. It started the rollover at the end of September. And in early October, barely off the high, not enough to alarm anybody looking at a price chart, you blew a floor out on quarterly momentum, the same kind of floor that you could see on that NASDAQ chart. Uh, and you, you crashed. Now, I'm not arguing this time it has to be a crash, but it's going to be dramatic and it's going to be the start of something major because there's also annual momentum trend structures that are even longer term metrics. So it's like, you know, this moderate sized bridge on the River Kwai collapses and the big one goes too. you know, uh, we're in that condition now. And I don't think you're going to be able to avoid it. And if you look for a fundamental reason for it. And look at an M2 chart. Accelerated decay in the money supply, you know, the increase in the money supply, therefore degradation of the money unit. It's accelerated over the last 10 years, more than any other prior 10 year period in terms of growth in the money supply. Uh, and then if you look at the Fed funds rate chart, go back 50 years, 60 years, it never has it been free for 10 of the last 15 years. You had free money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like drugs in an arm. You know, the needle's been put in and you begin given, you know, hallucinogens for the last 10, 15 years of extremely low rates. Therefore, the cost of money, which is a factor in decision making for companies, for families, governments, everything, that's been delusional. So you've you've created an error in planning, and it's lasted over a decade and a half now. So it's not just an error that's occurred over two, three years. It's a it's not only uh, you know excessive on the upside, but it's excessive in time. So a lot of errors have been built into the economy that are micro family type things, government spending, state, local, federal, and corporate planning that are based on certain assumptions that were false. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly, you know, they realize, uh oh, you know, it wasn't real, and all kinds of consequences will occur because of that. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay. That, that's that's why we have time to be able to go into okay. the nuances of, of, <laughs> okay. uh, of these markets. Anyway, I think that's where we are, is in that type of situation, where uh, the momentum will break first. And and we define those numbers in our reports, and we update those reports. You know, the, Sometimes the numbers will change when you move into a new quarter, for example. A quarterly momentum will change where the three-quarter average is, and therefore the what takes to break the momentum structure. Uh, and so our subscribers get those updates. And those numbers are nearby. In fact, if you looked at the price chart and circled the points where we say price better not go here, look at the price chart and say, that doesn't matter. It does. You break momentum, you'll break price. Right. You know, going back to this example of when the market sells off, like the general market, mm -hmm. whether that be the S&P, Nasdaq, whatever. Does that also, you know, create this this shorter term downward pressure in in the metals when people are, you know, getting margin called mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. selling anything they can to get liquidity and yeah. to to create liquidity? The historical correlation of whenever you've had a crash in the stock market, and again, let's talk about eighty seven. Mm -hmm. I, I went back and looked at it. I, I wasn't aware of it at the time. But while the S&P was collapsing, a crash, literally 35% in a matter of days, okay, that's a real crash, uh, gold went up 7% that week. Same week that, that, you know, gold wasn't even in a dynamic bull trend at that point. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like it had its own firepower. It was resisting. Uh, it wasn't in, in a real strong trend, and yet it went up while the stock market crashed. And when the stock market finally bounced, gold dropped a bit. <laughs> so, you know, the correlation was inverse. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one thing in everybody's memory. Well, two times, really. The COVID event where everything went down together. Mm -hmm. And to the October of 2008 event. Now, that's a full year off of the bull market peak in the stock market, the chart we just looked at, you know, where you peaked in October 2007. Well, in October of 2008, a full year off the high, all during that time, major decline in the stock market. Gold had been going up. But in that three to four week period in October of 2008, gold was ripe for a correction by technical metrics. And therefore, it joined in on the stock market for that one month of bad downside. Mm -hmm. So everybody seems to remember that 
event, that two, October 2008 thing, and therefore assumes that that must be the case all the time. It is not the case all the time. In fact, most of the time, it is not the case. Gold will move opposite to the stock market. And I'm not claiming that if we break these momentum structures on the stock market, that the consequence necessarily will be a crash. It will be a bear market. And you may get a quick 10 or 15% drop, but I don't think you're going to get a 35%. And generally, crashes constitute usually in a matter of a couple of weeks, a 30 plus percent drop. That's what a crash is, 29, 87, and that October of 2008 event, which late in the bear trend, the stock market did finally puke about 30 percent in a month. OK, uh, of course, that was near the end of the bear market almost. Uh, and gold did join in. But everybody has that burnt in their memory. And it's an error. Okay, it's an error. Uh, you go back through history and find a lot of these big down events in the stock market. They don't correlate whatsoever to down and gold. Mm -hmm. What about watching the the silver versus gold spread chart? How is that instructive as well, Michael? That's very important. Uh, silver is what we call a wild dog on a leash. <laughs> okay, but it's got a leash, mm -hmm. meaning what gold does, silver is going to do. If gold's going up and stays going up, silver is going to go up, despite its seemingly irrational swings. It'll swing ahead of gold and vastly outperform it and sometimes vastly underperform it. Uh, examples, gold had this surge in March and April of this year. And by April high, gold was at 2450. And if you go sideways, April, May, and June, gold basically was capped by that, that level, okay? But in April, when gold finally made that peak, that led to sideways. Silver exploded another handful of dollars and went from below 30 to 32. You know, so there, the, the, there was a different, uh, no, excuse me, yeah, went up to 32, I think it was. But anyway, there was a further surge by silver while gold sat still. So that was a period where the, the wild dog and the leash ran ahead of gold. And then, yes, for instance, two weeks ago, we had a sharp drop in silver. We had a mild drop in gold. And so the mama market, the one holding the leash didn't really drop much, but silver, like, like I'm going to jump off a cliff. Well, <laughs> we made that low. It was Tuesday a week ago. We put out a report and said, this is a bear trap. Do not, do not pay attention to this day. Mm -hmm. At that point, we were down, you know, just above uh, 30, I think it was in the thirties, low thirties. And it had been, you know, above 32 and 33 even. So we'd had a sharp drop there. So again, the leash went the other way, but if you looked over at gold, it was steady. And what happened? Silver is now back up, pushing toward 32 now. Okay. So now, when we measure the spread of silver versus gold, it's a ratio. We divide the price of silver into gold. And so we get a percent. So silver, if you go back 50 years and plot a, a bar graph chart, which we did in the weekend report, showing the peak silver to gold spread reading that year, you'll see that in that 50-year period, 21 of those years reached at least 2% level, where silver was 2% of the price of gold. In the 1980 bull market, when silver reached 50, that first time it ever did, it was up to 6.5% of the price of gold. And then it fell back down. And then in the 19, at 2011 peak, when silver again reached 50, gold was 1900 Silver reached three plus percent the price of gold. Silver right now is 1.189% or 1.19%, let's say, the price of gold. It's very cheap historically in relation to the price of gold. Mm -hmm. But when you measure the spread technically, week by week or even day by day, and create a momentum chart of it, you can even see it on the spread chart. You get up above 1.3% by much, and you're going to blow a cork meaning silver is going to outperform gold vastly. It's going to unleash technically. And again, we're just below 1.2% right now. And I think there's enough things just above 1.2 to drive you up to that 1.3 plus percent level and trigger this bigger stuff. But if silver went to 2% of the price of gold, again, it's been at 2% 21 of the past 50 years. So it's hardly an excessive thing. And gold were even, you know, just 3,000. Okay, 2% of 3,000, you do the math, okay? All-time new highs, 60 bucks, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, 
And I don't think gold's going to go into 3,000. A lot of people have that as a working target, some major firms. I think silver, I think gold's going, the next stopping point will be 3,200. And if silver happened to be 2% then, and the spread broke out, and by the way, when that spread breaks out, it is also a signal that the net price action of both metals is about to go vertical. It happened in 1979 to 80, mm -hmm. when the spread exploded. Silver exploded. Gold exploded too, but silver led. And it happened in 2010, latter half of 2010, prior to the Russian silver by April of 2011, where it reached 50 bucks again. The spread broke out. And sure enough, silver price unleashed at the same time, net-wise and versus gold. And we have the same pending situation right now, where if we break that spread out, you don't even have to look at a silver chart or a gold chart anymore. Just assume they're both going to go vertical. Only this time, silver is going to vastly outpace gold. And it's got so much room to do so, to even get back to, quote, what you could call normal levels. That if gold were to go to, for instance, our next level that we think there might be a, a stumble or a pause is 3,200. Mm -hmm. Well, if silver reached 2%, we'd be $66. So I think what we're seeing right now in silver with this congestive action in the low 30s is when you break out of this stuff, those two peaks at 50, historical old peaks, 1980, 2011, they're going out fast. Then likely silver is going to gush past those highs before it even pauses. And that'll, of course, what? Wake up the world. Michael, so, you know, when, when we're thinking about this analysis, really, and, and you're explaining how this market works, you know, historically, it makes me wonder how the fundamentals come, come into play here. You know, we keep hearing that there's a silver deficit. Mm -hmm. There's, there's this, you know, crazy projected silver deficit. How do you look at the fundamentals? And do you, does that, you know, not really end up informing what you, what you see no. in this market? No, those, those fundamentals are real. We know that they're not, mm -hmm. they're not fake. And uh, silver price is not tend to reflect those fundamentals. But the, the new game in town is China and electric uh, voltaic cells that are used in solar panels. They produce about 80, 90 percent of the world's solar panels. And therefore, their demand for silver is incredible. So, you know, when, you know, 50 years ago, silver was, you know, <laughs> used in photographs. OK, not anymore. OK. And, and now it's been taken over by solar panels and they, they consume a huge percent of the annual production of silver. And it's increasing double digit every year. And, you know, you, that's a background feature that's not discussed much. It's the kind of thing that if you ever had that come out to the fore, where people start instead of just looking at silver as a lag dog to gold, just another monetary metal. Silver has that extra attribute that its industrial demand is outpacing its production. And if that ever became a topic of conversation, you could create a panic moment. Uh, you know, outside, we're suddenly, outside our circles. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, even the US folks would recognize, I suspect I'm going to make a bet. If silver engages as we think it's about to and blows out the recent highs and then takes out the two peaks at 50, which I don't think is a big effort, by the way. I think that could happen quickly. We have some working targets, not again, not for a top, but for a, a first pause point after you blow that stuff out mm -hmm. in the mid 50s to 60. OK. I bet during that you'll get a sudden public awareness of the supply demand thing, which is not being discussed whatsoever in silver, unless you pay attention closely. You're in the industry. You know, I understand that uh, the Central American silver production, the countries down there, that China's buying that market like crazy, the raw material. And they're even paying spot silver prices for unrefined silver ore. I mean, for stuff that really isn't pure silver, they're paying full prices. They, they want silver. They need silver so bad. Now, silver, the pricing of solar panels has come down and down and down. It's 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 cheap. Poor people throughout the world can can consume it and they need it because like in Africa, for example, a lot of people have cell phones, but they don't have 
necessarily the home type power that you and I have, where there's a, a utility company, then there's the wires under the ground and all that. They have to p- depend on solar panels to get some power. And so the Chinese are selling in that market and also throughout Asia, where this demand is enormous. Where solar demand is really enormous and it's starting to grow in the U.S. too, by the way, for obvious reasons, uh, independent power, with a sense of safety. Uh, once that becomes an awareness factor of the investor, which again, it's not now, it's known fact, but not discussed. I'm suspecting that a price surge in silver will generate attention focus on that issue, not the other way around, where the issue comes up and suddenly silver takes off because of it. Instead, silver will take off and then people will say, gee, you know why? And that'll become a topic. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, we know about that, but I don't. we can't trade off that. It's 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 a background feature that ultimately will play. Mm-hmm. And think about this too: copper in 2011 made a high at 450. Well, copper got up over five recently. It's trading above 450 now. Well, silver in 2011 was 50 bucks. If copper can take out its high, then why can't silver? It will. Okay, uh, and I, I think it'll do it suddenly. And I think then that's when these what you mentioned the fundamental factor of silver, which is unique. It's an industrial aspect uh, could suddenly become, you know, a top hot topic. Mm-hmm. Going back to this idea of this momentum versus price signal, have we been given a similar signal in, you know, that we already spoke about from silver in the gold miners GDX? Yes. You're getting the same type of action there. In fact, historically, we all know gold miners are dirt cheap. And not just in price, but dirt cheap in relation to where they like measure the XAU index or the or GDX ETF in relation to the S and P five hundred. And you go back to the early part of this century, you know, two thousand to two thousand six and seven. You know, they were their relative pricing to S and P was much higher than it is now, vastly higher. And so they're very cheap in relation to the stock market. They're also very very cheap in relation on a spread basis to gold. So they're off the page cheap. Okay, so we know one, they're cheap. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's that's a virtue. You know, you want to buy low, sell high. Okay. Now, if you also, if you carefully look at the spread relationship, you'll see that when we made the bear market low in 2015 in gold, which was near 1,050, and you look at where GDX was at that point in time, what its price was, and you look at the current GDX price now and look at the current gold price and see how much they're up versus that low, GDX is actually up more, so is XAU, than gold is. So they've actually outperformed gold, not a lot, mm-hmm. since over the last you know 10 years. So as gold has more than doubled, they've also more than doubled. And most people aren't aware of that. They think, oh, these are dogs. Yes, in relation to where they were in that surge in the summer of 2020, where gold miners beat the pants off gold for that period, and so did silver. Then the gold miners suddenly went into this retrenchment where gold went sideways and they went down. And so, but they're still, even today, even though the GDX is below its summer 2020 high, which was 45.70, right now we're trading above 40, okay? So we're still below that high, gold's well above that. They're still doing better than they were from the 2015 low. Now, when you run a spread of GDX versus gold, it's breaking out. Meaning if you technically analyze that relationship, there are trend structures that you can see on the momentum of the spread that you're breaking out above. Mm -hmm. So the same thing I said about silver taking off versus gold, the miners will do that too. In fact, they're in the early process of that right now. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would be looking, well, just look, go back to February, Newmont Mining. You know, it was $32, 31, 32. Now it's 55, you know, uh, percent wise, they beat gold since February. Okay. Uh, so I think that also when you shake up that stock market a bit and you start to rattle some large portfolio managers, they look around and say, what's working? You know, whether they're gold bugs or not, they look at the miners and say, that's been working. You know, they've been going up nicely this year. And so, you know, that alone is an incentive for them without even having an you know, objective understanding of why. Uh, they, they just look at what's performing well and they say, I got to be in a better performing place. And that's a tiny little marketplace, gold miners, dollar wise. And when a, just a little bit of money shakes out of the stock market and goes there, it could goose that sector really big. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's about to happen. Well, and I mean, not only what that that becomes a sector of what's working, but I think as as these margins start to increase, as earnings start to keep coming out being very positive for the miners, you know, maybe maybe they start increasing dividends, share buybacks, things like that. That becomes yeah. a sector that just almost ends up feeding on itself and creating its own positive momentum. Yeah, we don't focus on the earnings issue, but the percent earnings, you know, like Newmont and so forth, are pretty high. <laughs> it's pretty pretty good stock to own for the, the you know your earnings and uh, it's uh, your dividends. I mean, and so that's another incentive. And also, probably at some point, I don't think early on, but later on, when this this phenomenon occurs, where the miners take off relative to gold and the stock market wobbles, therefore encouraging a shift in assets. I think you could have a situation where the big miners start buying up the little guys. Okay. And that's when you want to focus on the junior miners. Mm-hmm. Now, right now they're not leading, but I think they could very easily, let's say six months or a year down the road, once it becomes publicly, you know, a, a hot area, that's where you'll see the tail end of that market suddenly go up in decimals that are, you know, percentages far greater than the, the large miners. And that's not the case right now, but I think that could become the case. And you could reach some incredible levels on the miners, uh, just getting back to old norms mm-hmm. in terms of old ratios to the S&P, old ratios to gold uh, would be incredible price levels. And so I think that is a place to, yeah, watch gold. It's the mama market. It's the king, right? uh, the mama. Okay. Mm-hmm. But silver and the miners will outpace it. And I think we're at that point where that's about to occur in a noticeable way. So is it almost like, you know, can we picture this market almost like a set of of smaller dominoes almost as as in the the let's say the the relative size you know you start mm-hmm. with the the big producers like Newmont like you mm-hmm. said that ends up kind of this this reverse domino effect in my mind th- that I'm picturing that mm-hmm. ends up knocking over these these mid tiers because they need to be replacing their ounces and then that ends up knocking yeah. over the juniors yeah. which you know boosts up and then the the developers and explorers as well. Yes, I uh, absolutely. That's exactly what I think would happen. Is that, mm-hmm. uh, as you said, that you know the earnings of these companies is great, and and frankly, I think the most analysts have simply simply not incorporated into their thought process that these earnings could stay good. <laughs> I think there've been doubters at the price level of gold, like oh, you can't stay up here. You know, it's going to go down. Therefore, the earnings of these companies go back down. They're not okay. Mm-hmm. Said the price keeps going up, mm-hmm. and it's not exploding yet. Which is not going vertical, uh, and we talk about you know where might gold go? That's a, that's a hot, you know where's gold going? They ask me. Okay, mm-hmm. and all I can say is if you go back and look at that 1980 peak, and go back to the bear market that preceded it, 103 dollars went to 850, and then you look at the lows that occurred in the year 2000 2001, uh, just above 260 dollars an ounce, and you went to 1920. You're talking about eightfold moves. Some of them took a few years. Some of them took nearly a decade. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. We're now in the ninth year of the bull trend. And a lot of those movements occurred late in the bull trends. But we're only a little more than double. So on a ratio basis, you, put, you get a logarithmic chart of gold, for example, go back 50 years, and you'll see that, well, yeah, we're, we're up there in new highs. Yeah, of course. But it, it's not anywhere near the ratio of those two moves, which are both, again, like eightfold. Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- those were based on events that are nowhere comparable to what we've been talking about as drivers for gold. In other words, the, the fundamental macro global situation. Uh, this time, gold could go a lot more than eightfold, but it hasn't even gone eightfold yet. So, I mean, again, you break up, you damage the stock market and cause money to flow out. It's going to go into gold and gold miners and silver. It's going to go into T-bonds for a while. So it's going to seek new homes. But I think gold, the monetary metals are going to be a, a primary focus area, and we could go ballistic in terms of percent gain from even where we are now. Uh, and I think a lot of that's going to occur. One, I think some of that could occur between now and you know, let's say the next month or so. And not not movements to the eight thousand, no, but a, a, a sharp further surge, like silver into the mid fifties, for example. But by next year, I think a lot of that move toward the normal eightfold could you could see it in gold. 
Now, you're not just going to see it isolated. You're going to see reasons for it suddenly become very apparent to everybody. Like, well, one, the stock market's broken. Oh, my gosh. And two, the Fed's panicked and ECB is panicked and BOJ is panicked. And also you can see government debt markets panic, go down, up in yields. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you'll have T-bond rally first. But on the other hand, if that market rolls over again, then that alternative to the stock market will no longer be seen as an alternative again. It'll start right. behaving like it did in 2022, where it went down with stocks. And that leaves what? <laughs> Commodities and gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was thinking as you were explaining that this, let's say, gold market or gold bull market from that 1971 to 1980 era, and that, let's say, fundamental repricing at that point. Mm -hmm. You're saying that we have a far more volatile and, let's say, bigger driver type setup mm -hmm. for gold now than than a fundamental shift yeah. in how the world values gold. No, I think you've got a government debt market crisis and uh, a government crisis and a currency crisis, not just dollar versus the euro, for example, the dollar index. I'm talking about the overall valuation of the money units mm -hmm. where the public will become more and more aware that, you know what, uh, I'm paying more for gasoline because it's not because gasoline's going up. It's because the dollar is going down in real spending power. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back historically and and, you know, measure things by M2, you know, they almost doubles every decade. Well, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, a loaf of bread was 20 cents. OK, we don't have a wheat drought. OK, you got a degradation in the money unit and it's ongoing. And sometimes because when the central banks panic, that degradation in the money unit increases in terms of percentages. And I think we're at that point now where when you break these stock market bubbles, specifically the U.S. bubble in particular, that's going to cause massive central bank panic, which is going to do nothing but more exacerbate this underlying fiat currency degradation and hence commodity price inflation. And again, you know, it's really it's really not them going up. It's the, the money unit collapsing and it's affecting people. Uh, and a lot of people don't see it that way. They think, you know, gold is going up. In fact, it's not. It's the dollar in real value collapsing or the euro in the yen. And when that gets out of hand and there's a public perception that that's really what's going on here, then you have an upending of a lot of institutions. You know, I've been saying for over a year now, there'll be a point in the next couple of years, you don't have a Federal Reserve. I'll make that bet. Uh, it is intellectually dismissed. And there's even a lot of academicians who are favorable to the Fed, have been for decades, that are, you know, doubting its uh, policy directions for the last couple of years, especially too, too high, too long, that kind of thing. Uh, and where there's enough doubt, and when you go back and look at the boom-bust cycles of, of the stock market, they correlate very well, lag to the boom-bust cycles in monetary policy. You boom the money supply up, and the stock market a year or two later takes off. And then suddenly, the, if the you know, they start to level it out or they start to raise rates, then the stock market at lag to that goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, and But this time, it's different because the bubble is so much bigger, especially in the U.S., and also Japan uh, and, and India. But uh, focus on the U.S. Uh, if it busts, and we claim it's the biggest bubble in U.S. history in dimensionality and duration, uh, that when it breaks, the unwinding of so many errors and policy errors as well will come to the fore. And, uh, you know, the Mises Institute, which is one of the largest, it's a libertarian think tank. They had a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal about a month or two ago. That said, abolish the Fed or end the Fed. It was a whole page, it looked mm -hmm. like an editorial, but it was just—it was an ad. But it was an intellectual argument to abolish the Fed. And there's a lot of people who are, you know, if you run into this crisis that we're trying to define here, the stock market implosion, and ultimately a government debt market crisis, people are going to look back and say, you know, the Fed's booms and busts in monetary policy create nothing but booms and busts in the economy. They're not a cure; they're a cause. Hence, what do we need them for? We didn't always have them, you know, only been around 100 years, not been around 1,000. And maybe we need to go back to real money. Thoughts come up in other countries as well, by the way. There are intellectuals in Europe and elsewhere that have said, you know, we, we, we've made errors here in the last decades, you know, non-back currencies. 
And I think once you hit a, have a crisis, then suddenly that process, that thinking process will occur and policy changes will occur where things are abolished and probably quickly. So it's going to be an interesting coming year. I think a lot of this is going to happen in the next year. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, so I it's, think- it's, it's different this time is what I'm saying. That's mm, OK. Yeah, I mean. I think a lot of people that have, let's say, done the same type of reading or research or discussions that you and I have would agree with that, that viewpoint on the Fed. But, you know, when you go through the the history of the Fed and the history of these central banks, I feel like there's, there's a lot of power and ability to kind of point the blame elsewhere mm-hmm. um, by those institutions. And, yep. and I, th- and I think that, that ends up really standing at opposition with with what you just said, unfortunately. Yeah, it does. Uh, they definitely point elsewhere. They're never the cause. You'll never yeah. hear them say, we, oh, we, we made a mistake or whatever. Uh, but there's enough people out there who become aware of it. Or if you re- end up in a real crisis here, the stock market does begin to implode, which of course creates emotion mm-hmm. on the part of everybody, <laughs> wealthy and the m- middle income. Uh there's enough academicians and economists out there who are wavering about you know the validity of what the Fed's done and so forth. But there's enough. When you get a crisis, it causes a rethinking of, of certain things, and sudden, and it's often a sudden rethinking of things. So it's not like a, a slow, gradual process. I think it's something that a crisis helps cause mm-hmm. the intellectual response to it. And Being therefore, a catalyst the for. yeah, it's the catalyst. And, you know, it's not going to happen ahead of the event. The event's going to happen. And then we're going to say, God, you know, these guys haven't stopped anything. They've caused everything once they realize and make the connection of the, the boom bust cycles. And some people have done that. I think there's going to be an awareness that a hands up in the air. We need something else. Maybe you don't have the answer to that, but you say something's not right with what we have. We need to get rid of it and figure out something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, hands up in the air, and it, it, what causes that is market panic, and therefore, and price hurt to people's portfolios and retirement accounts. Therefore, survivability uh, that causes the thought process to come later. Mm-hmm. So it's not the other way around. So what I'm talking about now seems very speculative, but if you topple these certain markets, the key markets that, that most people think are key, uh, and cause an earthquake in, in thinking process, that's that's when you'll get that kind of change that you didn't expect to get. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you walking us through all of these all of these markets and especially you know these these longer time frame ways to to look at them. Is there anything that you'd like to leave our audience to to think about before we wrap up here? No, I just think that the other variable we talked about at the beginning, that's part of this upset process. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the political upset, I don't think is something unique. I think it's part of this ongoing rising of this crisis that's expressed in various ways that aren't necessarily connected to the actual causal effects, but creates emotion on both sides to where you no longer have this balance back and forth between the two dominant parties. Instead, you have this sense of desperation on both sides and panic. And again, no matter who wins this election, you're not going to have a stable outcome. So that's going to fit very nicely with the unstable outcome in the stock market as well. I don't know which is going to come first. It's quite probable before the next president gets inaugurated that the stock market will have begun to cave in a big way. Now, whether that partly occurs before the election or after, I don't know. No doubt one side will blame the other for it, regardless. <laughs> Whereas Powell and Bernanke and, uh, you know, et cetera, even Greenspan should be blamed for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, these big macro things we've been talking about all are part of that process of upheaval. Mm-hmm. They're not independent. Well, and and I think, you know, to your earlier point, whoever, wh- whomever ends up 
inheriting these positions, whether that be at the Fed, whether that be at the Treasury, whether it be the next president, none of them are going to be in a favorable or envious position. I think they're all going to have some incredible headwinds to face. Oh, yeah. Well, Javier Malay, for example, is an anarcho-capitalist, was elected president in Argentina. It used to be the seventh biggest economy in the world mm-hmm. 50 years ago. Okay. Now, it's a, you know, it's a two-party system. Two parties competing with each other. Led it to a socialist quiet dictatorship for decades. And, and the desperation, the sense of this isn't working, especially among a youth vote, led to Javier Malay beating both parties. And he didn't even have a party. Just a young, popular guy. He's also an intellectual, by the way. He's not mm-hmm. just a popular guy. But he warned. He warned ahead of time. He says, if I win this, it's not going to be pretty. Mm-hmm. Because these events that have happened over the prior decades are ugly, and they're going to require pain, create pain, when they come unwrapped. Mm-hmm. But already he's created some good down there. And uh, in this, for example, he, he destroyed all the government departments that controlled rent control apartments and so forth, therefore helped determine pricing of apartments, which was in tight supply because the prices were so high in relation to what the, the lower income people could afford. That suddenly come down 20%, I understand. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people who couldn't afford housing can now afford it. So he's had some victories there, mm-hmm. but it's going to be painful. So, you know, and it's because of decades of what we've been doing, finally piling up to the point where it just implodes and whoever inherits, it's going to inherit it. So... Take care of yourself, everybody. <laughs> Being the right investments at the right time. Yeah. Well, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting three weeks. It's going to be an interesting three months, and you know, even eighteen months. I think. Yeah. This is yeah. this is going to be a, a really consequential and let's say illuminating time on what what some of these misallocations from this yep. manipulated market have been. Mm-hmm. Bad ideas lead to bad events. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> On that happy note, Michael, I always appreciate the time. Of course, all of your work available at olivermsa.com and of course at Oliver underscore MSA on Twitter. Michael, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.